All right, well, according to my watch, it's after 7, uh, so we are going to get started with our Bible study tonight. I'm sure there will be more people joining us as the evening goes on, uh, but at least for now, we will get going. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we give you thanks and praise for gathering us together, at least virtually, again this evening. We pray that as we dig into your word and as we look at Scripture geographically, that we would grow in our knowledge and understanding of you and to grow in our faith of you as well, our trust, knowing that you are uh, in control of, of even your people throughout history down to us today. Bless us in, as, our, as we study your word, that you would be glorified in us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, before we get too far into things today, I want to uh, encourage you, if you don't have a Bible in front of you right now, please do take a moment to go grab one. Uh, you may also want a pen and paper, pencil and paper, uh, just to take notes, jot things down. That is uh, not a bad idea either. Uh, but in case you don't have anything, take a moment to go do that right now. Um, as we start uh, digging in in just a moment, there's I know one thing left over from last week that we'll start with, but before I hit on what I know that we need to talk about, is there anything else that you can think of that uh, you've got questions left over from last time that you think we should uh, discuss before moving forward? Since I don't hear anything right offhand, we are going to get going with tonight's lesson then. Uh, we'll start by pulling up this PowerPoint, and we should be good to go here. So uh, just as a, a recap, a review from last week, um, we last week did a just a basic geographic overview of the land of israel we had one map basically that we looked at and took a look at each individual section on that map trying to make sure that we saw as a whole uh, just the variety that exists in this land of israel um, the geography plays a role in the story of scripture as how it all plays out uh, and so we took a look at just the general overview. Um, tonight we're going to get a general geographic region again, um, but it will be a lot more specified, a lot more digging into Scripture to see what happens in a, in a smaller chunk of land. Uh, most of the rest of the time that we're gathered together, we're going to be taking a look at specific sites, specific cities, but um, tonight's a little bit broader and there's a lot that happens in this area we're talking about the Jezreel Valley tonight before we do that um, this is what I know is left over from last week uh, there's a question about wadi what what are wadi and specifically what do they look like uh, so we've got a couple pictures to show you of just examples of some wadi from Israel remember wadi's kind of a a little bit like a dry riverbed, but it's it's a little bit more than that. It's kind of like a canyon, but it's not. Um, this is a picture from one of my uh, atlases in my office. Uh, you see just a lot of very um, broken down rocks and limestone that are around the edges of it with some little stream that flows through this and a little bit of vegetation down there. But it's very rocky, very uh, kind of a barren, stark looking, uh, look, stark looking chunk of territory. Um, this next picture is one that actually Pastor Lisansky took on one of his trips over to Israel. Um, this is uh, a picture of Wadi Kilt. Uh, this is a, a dry riverbed canyon. It's a wadi that runs between Jerusalem and Jericho. It's actually a pretty important wadi, a pretty important uh, piece of, of land here. Uh, maybe thinking to the Gospels, do any of you have in mind, or can you think of uh, an account that takes place between Jerusalem and Jericho? If 
you can't, that's okay. The story uh, or the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan took place on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. There was a traveler going alongside of the road from Jericho through to Jerusalem, and somewhere along the way that he is attacked, beat up by robbers, and left for dead. And this is the setting for that parable. Um, there's a, a road that runs along the ridge of this wadi. Sometimes it kind of steeps down a little bit, dips down into the wadi itself, but by and large it's up on the top, and it's uh, quite an interesting terrain here. Uh, so this is in general what those wadi look like as we're exploring those uh, um, that chunk of territory. Any questions on wadi before we dig into stuff for tonight? All right, we will get going then. Uh, this is our map that we've been using, or we used last week, and we'll, we'll bring this up a few more times again tonight, but this is just generally the land of Israel. You've got the Sea of Galilee up here, the Dead Sea, uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea over here, and it's really this chunk of land that historically has been considered the Promised Land, the land of Israel. We're going to be really narrowing in our look at this map, bringing it up close. And really what we're going to be focusing on is this little triangle here, um, just southwest of the Sea of Galilee. This is the Jezreel Valley, and, and, and in a moment I'll pull up a different map. It moves it much closer, but just as a warning, it shifts in orientation. Uh, this map is, of course, north is up in this uh, map, but the map we'll be using, and, and we'll probably be using maps like this throughout our class, north will be to the left, and east is up. Uh, it's a slightly different way of looking at things, but with how long and skinny this land is, it actually does make a lot of sense to lay it out horizontally instead of vertically. So, with that being said, um, it might be helpful to, to keep your eye on the Sea of Galilee and see how that rotates for this next map. So if that's north is up, here is the Jezreel Valley with east being up and much great, more greatly zoomed in. Sea of Galilee is here. You can tell it's been rotated uh, just with that unique shape of the sea there. And the land that we're looking at here, this Jezreel Valley, is roughly this triangle of land. Uh, I guess just, just in the bottom right of the picture, roughly, uh, just south and west of center here. Um, it's the Jezreel Valley. It's named the Jezreel Valley because one of the prominent cities of it is Jezreel, just sitting right here on one of the entrances. Uh, but there are a lot of really important cities along the way, a lot of important monuments and, and mountains and different things like that. And we're going to be taking a look at a lot of different um, places here. Just as a general uh, scale here, general sense of scale, um, the distance from one of these corners to the next uh, along Mount Carmel, this Carmel Ridge, is about 20 miles. And then um, from either of these corners up to Mount Tabor here, which is roughly the other point of the triangle, uh, these are just about 17 miles long. So it's just shy of an equilateral triangle, uh, but this is the Jezreel Valley, the, the name of the valley that we'll be looking at exploring tonight. Um, we're going to take a look at a picture, actually, of the Jezreel Valley before we keep moving. Um, but just to give you a perspective, the picture is taken in the city of Megiddo, which is uh, kind of the center bottom of that triangle, and it's looking out directly across the Jezreel Valley. And you'll be able to see Mount Tabor right in the center of the picture uh, with Mount Mora and uh, the Nazareth Ridge on either side of that mountain as well. Now uh, there's Jezreel Valley. I circled it for you. Uh, but here's that photo. 
This is, again, from Megiddo, and this kind of, uh, actually, a very nicely shaped mountain right ahead. That is Mount Tabor, um, and over here is the Hill of Mora that you can just see starting, and, and this set of mountains, uh, hills over on the left-hand side um, is what we would now call Nazareth Ridge. It's uh, the ridge that Nazareth sits on. All right. Any questions before we jump into our first scriptural text for tonight? Yes, and, and we'll talk about that tonight. Um, it's partly with the name there that uh, Har Megiddo, the, the plains of Megiddo, so it's, it's tied in with that. And in fact, we'll be taking a look at a lot of the battles that were fought in this valley. Um, that's not just the plains of Megiddo, it's, it's the Jezreel Valley. Uh, so we'll be seeing how that plays into the whole end times account, if we can make it that far tonight. We'll see. <laughs> Any other questions before we keep moving? All right, why don't you open your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 4. Book of Judges, chapter 4. We'll eventually be reading uh, verses 12 through 15. I'm, I'm trying to keep these um, scripture readings short because there's just so much that we could talk about and we're trying to keep ourselves limited and narrowed in here. Um, just hit, fitting this story in historically, um, the people of Israel have been brought out of the land of Egypt through the Exodus. They've entered into the promised land. During the time of Joshua, they've worked to, to defeat some of the local residents of Canaan, the land that God had promised them, but they haven't driven out everyone. And so it's, this um, account and the next one take place during, during the time of the Judges. And um, we'll see that through these more localized contents, um, uh, localized narrative combats um, that Israel, the people of Israel, start to take over a little more territory and God uses these battles and uses his judges uh, to help the people to take a little bit stronger control of the land. So before we read our, um, our reading there from later on in chapter 4, I do, do just want to mention the town of Hazor. Um, that's up top on this map, uh, just north of the Sea of Galilee here. It's kind of at an important crossroads uh, of one of the international roads that runs through Galilee and up to Damascus and, and further north. Um, but this road that connects through the Jezreel Valley up to Hazor is sometimes called the Way of the Sea. That'll be important as we come to that later. Uh, but the king of the Canaanites, in at least this account in Judges chapter 4, his palace is in the city of Hazor. And that'll be important as we are digging into the text here tonight. I'll read for us just these few verses, 12 through 15, and then we'll take a look at the rest of these locations on the map as we are watching this battle play out in front of us. When Sisera was told that Barak the son of uh, Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of his sword. Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harasheth Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. 
it's actually one extra verse there to verse 16. Um, all right, so we've got Hazer up top here. Meanwhile, um, Barak at Deborah the judge's leading has gathered all the troops uh, at Mount Tabor. Uh, this is a good militarily defendable position on top of a hill you're fighting, not uphill but downhill. You've got a more defensive position. This is a great strategic location uh, for the army of the Israelites to be gathering here. Meanwhile, the uh, commander of the Canaanite army, a guy named Sisera, um, has gathered his troops, at least the next chapter tells us, at the waters of Megiddo and Tanakh. Well, Megiddo and Tanakh are uh, further on the, um, the west side of the Jezreel Valley, uh, Tanakh being a little further southeast of Megiddo. Uh, but they would have gathered pretty well probably on the plains immediately between or in front of these cities. Now just taking a look at the map here, why is the Israelite position a problem for the Canaanites? your army's here on one side of the Jezreel Valley and your king is way up here in Hazor and your enemy is between your king and your army, you're in trouble. Uh, this setup is not good for the Canaanites. In fact, it's uh, if they don't do something about it, it's going to lead to a lot of problems because well, the, Can the Israelites could simply head up that way of the sea and take over the, the city and the king and the army can't do much about it from where they are. Um, so the Canaanite army seems to follow this road through the Jezreel Valley. Um, the Kishon is really this whole stream that runs through here. It's, it's hard to nail that down in particular. Um, but it seems that they met in battle uh, just on the other side of Mount Tabor as the army of the Canaanites was coming through that Jezreel Valley. And the text says in, in verse 15, the Lord routed Sisera. And we probably could and should spend more time on this account and, and get into more of the details of Barak and uh, Deborah and Jael and, and all the different characters in this story. Uh, but generally, the sense that we get out of this text is that God will do what needs to be done in spite of his people's indecision and inaction. God had called Barak to, to lead this army and Barak wouldn't do it. Deborah came up and, and reminded him, hey, God has told you to do this. And it took him, took her going with him, almost literally holding his hand to go out into battle before he finally did that. Um, and God basically said, all right, because you're doing this, someone else will get the glory for taking care of this problem. Um, and yet we see in this account, God won't let knuckle-headed people get in his way of making things, uh, making his will to be done. Uh, God takes care of his people and he makes sure that they have the land that is promised to them. Any questions before we move on to our next account? All right, we'll flip ahead just a few chapters in the book of Judges to Judges chapter 7. Uh, this is really the next judge in, um, in Israelite history here. Uh, after Deborah and Barak do their thing, the people have about 40 years of peace. There's seven years of oppression before Gideon steps up on the scene. Uh, but the enemy that 
comes at this point is uh, the people of Midian. Again, we're going to zoom out our map to, to try to get a picture of that. Before we do, let's just start our account in, in Judges chapter 7, verse 1. And Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. All right. So first let's zoom out, find Midian, and then we'll take a look at how they're all set up on the map in front of us. So we're back to this Israel map. Midian is way down to the south along the gulf that is um, to the south there. Uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, I believe it's, it's called there. It doesn't play a whole lot uh, of a big role in the story of God's people. Uh, but Midian is along that body of water. And here they have come up into the land of Israel and they are camping out, causing trouble in the Jezreel Valley. All right, so we heard uh, a few of the places that people were uh, gathered. We, we know the whole account of Gideon winnowing down his army. Um, but they do that at this spring of Herod. Um, it's En Herod. Uh, en is the uh, Hebrew word for spring. So it's the spring of Herod right here on the, the edge of the Jezreel Valley. Gideon's army gathers there. They're in the spring. They, they narrow down their fighting uh, men to just 300. Meanwhile, the Midianites are camped on the hill of Morah, just right next door. I mean, they're, they're close. Now, we can't be super specific with uh, exactly where they are if it says the hill of Morah. But chances are, if Gideon and his army are in this valley of where en -Harod is, chances are the Midianite army is to the north of the hill of Morah somewhere. Um, Gideon's not going to parade his troops out in front of that whole army just willy-nilly. So um, we'll see that plays into account in just a moment here. Um so let's read these verses, verses 19 through 23, and we'll see how the whole account plays out here. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. They blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. And the three companies blew their trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shitta, towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Beth Mahola by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. All right. So we've got the people of Gideon, his army, have gone and surrounded the Midianite camp and freaked them out in the middle of the night, so much so that they ended up attacking themselves and running away. Uh, it's probably somewhere around there that their camp was and that Gideon's army surrounded and defeated them. And the cities that they fled to were much further south, uh, south uh, east, so kind of along the road to uh, the land of Midian. But along the way, Gideon calls out people from a lot of the different tribes that have territory allotted to them here. Uh, again, we'll take a look at some of these tribes. Don't worry about uh, remembering where they all are. Maps are helpful in this regard, so you don't have to know exactly um, all the diff distinct borders. But Asher is generally up here uh, along the coast of Galilee there. 
Uh, they have some trouble because the Philistines, uh, not the Philistines, the Phoenicians are up in that part of the coast, but that's the land allotted to them. Uh, the land of Zebulun is kind of the, the hill country, the heart of this Galilee area. Naphtali is a lot closer to the Sea of Galilee. Um, Issachar is not mentioned here, but they've got kind of this land that's right along the way, um, along the Jordan River, kind of bordering the uh, east side of the Jezreel Valley. Manasseh has a weird chunk of territory. They, their um, territory follows the Carmel Ridge, and then it comes up, and it gets Beth Shean, and then it jumps back down again. Um, and that's all uh, their territory. Ephraim plays a, a part later in the story. They start complaining because um, Gideon went to some of these other tribes first. But Ephraim is much further to the south, off the map here. Uh, it's probably another screen length wide, um, further to the south. And it actually makes a whole lot of sense why uh, Gideon didn't go with them, because they're just not nearby. And they complain um, in spite of Gideon's best efforts. So, with this all being the case, with this whole encounter with um, God winnowing down the army, Gideon's army, to just 300 men, um, and completely routing the army of the Midianites, uh, we get this picture that God is working in spite of his people's smallness and their weakness. I mean, there's no way an army of 300 guys is going to be able to take out the whole army of the Midianites, and yet God does it. God uses this, albeit strange, encounter to bring peace back to the people of Israel and to uh, restore them to their land. After this, there's another 40 years of peace that that reigns in this time. Um, this battle becomes emblematic. It becomes kind of noteworthy in Israel's history as they look back on this account as God is bringing and preserving his people throughout history. So much so that Isaiah quotes from it and Matthew quotes from Isaiah quoting from it. We'll take a look at those passages here. We'll start in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. The events of Matthew chapter 4 are just after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He's been baptized. He's been driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Um, he hears that John is arrested, and that's kind of what kicks things off here in verse 12. When he heard that John had been arrested, Jesus withdrew into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death on them, has a light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so we've got Jesus from the town of Nazareth. Nazareth is right about the bottom left hand of the last E in this Galilee here. That's where Nazareth is from, in the land of Zebulun. And he moves to the Sea of Galilee, to a town of Capernaum. Um, that's part of the tribe of Naphtali. Um Put those names back on your map too. And you remember the road from Hazor down through the Jezreel Valley to this main international highway is, is the way of the sea. So 
Matthew says that Jesus coming into this territory, having spent most of his childhood in Nazareth, and then up into the Sea of Galilee, moving along this way of the sea, that is a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy about this light shining, bringing peace in this time. Now, we're going to follow this train of thought one step further. Go to Isaiah chapter 9. And we'll see a little bit even more closely how these, uh, this Old Testament and New Testament texts are related. Isaiah chapter 9. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Now that's where Matthew stops quoting, but the text really continues for quite some time here. You have multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. They're glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Remember, who was Gideon fighting? That was the Midianites. Isaiah says that the day that Zebulun and Naphtali, the way of the sea, is glorified, will be like that day when the Midianites are defeated and destroyed. There's something that happens when Jesus begins his public ministry that brings about God's peace, brings about the beginning of, of the restoration of all things, that this is uh, similar to this day of Midian. Uh, we can continue in this passage from Isaiah, and again, these words will be very familiar shortly on here. Every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, tumult, every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds pretty incredible. Uh, and, and to have that connection to the Jezreel Valley here, to, to Gideon and the Midianites and all that takes place in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali and, and the way of the sea, we've got this connection that Jesus fulfills and, and works in a similar, even a greater way than Gideon. Uh, not just 300 people fighting an army much bigger than them, but one person who dies for the sins of the world. Jesus is the greatest fulfillment of what happens uh, with Gideon and the Midianites. Any thoughts or questions before we keep going? I know I'm throwing a lot at you tonight. All right, we'll move on to our next account that takes place in the Jezreel Valley. This is much later in Israel's history. Uh, the judges' time has passed. Uh, there's several hundred years probably of, of judges. There's some debate as to how long exactly, but uh, it's a good several hundred years uh, before finally the people are sick and they demand a king. So finally, God gives them a king like all the other nations, which is what they ask for, uh, and they get King Saul. Uh, this is going to be um, one of the many battles that Saul and, and other people fight in the Jezreel Valley, but this ends up being Saul's downfall. Uh, 
whole account takes place here in the Jezreel Valley. So we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28. And we'll just get verses 3 through 7. Now again, to set the stage, Saul is king. He's already been rejected, though, by God because he's done a lot of stupid stuff in his life and ministry. And, and we'll see even now in, in his reign, he does some stupid things. Uh, David is... Uh, anointed as king. He's been fighting for the Philistines, uh, but the Philistines don't want him in battle against his natural homeland. So David's off somewhere else at this point. Uh, but the Philistines have gathered an army. They've come up through uh, the land of the Philistines, through the coastal plain, and they've come up to the Jezreel Valley, and they've camped up here at Shunem. And, and we'll hear about that in this reading here, starting at verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. Saul had put the mediums and necromancers out of the land. So the Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid. His heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or the prophets. Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. His servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. We could, again, spend a whole lot of time continuing on in this account, but, but you know how it goes. Saul goes uh, to this witch at Endor. He calls up Samuel from the dead. The witch freaks out, this medium, because it turns out she normally doesn't actually do this. Um, and so she freaks out when she sees Samuel, and, and Samuel really condemns Saul for his stupidity here. Um but how this plays out is even worse than it sounds, if that is even possible. You see, the Philistines are encamped at Shunem. Uh, this is just kind of a small little town on this hill, um, the hill of Mora, right along the base of that. That's where the Philistines have camped out. And the Israelites have, have gathered on the hill of Gilboa, uh, Gilboa is a big region, and exactly where on this hill, we're not entirely sure. Um, but we recognize that they make their way to, to Gilboa. They've gathered on top of this mountain, and that's where the Israelites have encamped. But Saul's not happy. He's not satisfied with how their situation is, so he tries to find a medium a witch to be able to summon Samuel from the dead. Now, the closest one to him is in Endor. Again, En being spring, so the spring of Dor. That's located just over here. The other side of the hill of Mora, behind enemy lines. In order for Saul to... Visit, visit this um, this witch, this necromancer. He's got to disguise himself, travel down the mountain, sneak around the invading army, and go see this witch at Endor, putting his life at risk along the way and his really his soul at risk by going to the medium at all. This encounter really does paint Saul in a horrible light, as I, as I mentioned, even worse than it sounds at first glance. When you see the geography of it, and when you watch that play out, uh, you realize that Saul is really in desperate straits. Um, God has rejected him as king, rightly so, and instead of stepping down or stepping back and letting David reign, 
Saul stubbornly tries to have it his way. And along the way, he causes a whole lot of problems. So, he goes, visits the witch at Endor. He comes back to Gilboa. Um, the word that Samuel says in this vision as he's drawn up by the witch is not good. Samuel says the Lord will give uh, you and the army into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me, he says. They're going to die. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. So with that in mind, Saul goes back and they have the battle. Um, just flip forward in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 31. There's some interlude there in chapters 29 and 30 is David's doing his thing. But we'll read this text and see how this all plays out. The Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines. They fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. He was badly wounded by the archers. Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. Also when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. The Philistines came and lived in them. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put Saul's armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his bodies to the wall of Beth Shean. Not a pleasant picture. Here Saul has been on Mount Gilboa. That tends to be, it looks like, where the battle was. That's where Saul and his sons all died and much of Israel with him. But did you catch what happens next? They take Saul's armor and they put it in the temple of Ashtaroth. Why would they do that? Why would an invading army take the king's armor and put it in the temple of their god. It would be like an offering to their god? Yeah, that could very well be as an offering to their god to say, you know, here's the, the protection of our enemies, it's, it's yours now. What else could it mean? The, the spoils of war. Spoils of war. Who, who's, in the, who's in the temple of their God? So their, their God, at least this God that they put the temple in, is Ashtaroth. Um, Ashtaroth is... Uh, one of the many local pagan deities. Um, I'm pretty sure Ashtaroth was the uh, female counterpart to the god Baal or Baal. Um, so Ashtaroth and Baal, Baal would have been kind of linked together as the male and female, primary male and female deities. Um, I'm pretty sure that's Ashtaroth and not one of the other um, goddesses, but uh, yeah, so that that would have been 
one of their their gods that they worshipped. But would there have been priests in that temple? Yeah, there would have been some sort of priestly system for that temple. I I'm not exactly sure what kind of ritualistic stuff happened at at a temple of Ashtaroth. I don't know, Pastor Lasansky. Do you have any more information on uh, uh, what would have happened at a temple of Ashtaroth? I can see he's joined us, and his mic is on, but we can't see him. But. Um, Maybe he'll join us in, in just a moment and be able to give us a better idea there. Um, but, so th this could have been spoils of war. It could have been kind of an offering to this God. Um, my guess is that the Philistines are saying, hey, our God is stronger than your God. You know, our God Ashtaroth was able to defeat your king who claims to have divine protection from Yahweh, from the Lord Adonai, uh, and here very clearly, that's not the case because we were able to kill your king. Um, so I think there's a taunting going on here, um, and that would have been uh, quite a shameful thing to have happened, to, to have your king's armor in the temple of a foreign deity. Um, we also saw that not only did his armor go to uh, this temple of Ashtaroth, they also said his, bodies, his body was hung fastened to the wall of Beth Shean. Uh, that city is right up there, a little bit further to the east of Mount Gilboa. Um, in fact, archaeologically, they've found a temple of Ashtaroth in Beth Shean, and uh, when we get there, hopefully we'll be able to see that if you're willing to make the extra climb to get there. Um, but why why do this? Why are you've got his armor in the temple? Why put his body on the wall? Yeah. Um, that, yeah, they were more powerful than their surrounding uh, peoples. You're, you're even able to see a little bit in this map here of just some of the roads that made their way through Beth Shean. You know, at this point, uh, Beth Shean is a pretty important city. Even before the people of Israel make their way into the Promised Land, um, the Egyptians have set up a city here. It's an administrative center for a while. Um, you've got a lot of roads running to and from it. It kind of guards some of this Jordan River Valley here, this Rift Valley. It's somewhat of a gateway into the Jezreel Valley itself. And putting the body of your slain enemy king on the wall really does send a message of, of power and intimidation. We're able to do this to anyone who opposes us. Stay out of our way. You know, it's interesting seeing this battle play out in the Jezreel Valley. This one does not provide a victory for God's people, but the circumstances seem to be rather different. You know, this time instead of Saul fighting on the Lord's side, the Lord has told him, this is not going to end well for you. In fact, Saul, a long time before this, had run afoul of God, and God's Spirit wasn't with him. Saul tried to do this on his own, and it ended only in his death, and in the death of his entire army and of all his sons, and it really put an end to Saul's line as king. You know, if we're able to take a single message from Saul's downfall here, it's, it's don't go against the Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit as Saul did. Um, it did not end well for him, and it won't end well for us either. Thoughts or questions before we hit our next uh, account? All 
All right. We're going to move ahead again in Israel's history. Um, we, this is kind of the start of the kingdom of Israel, and we're going to move to the end of it, uh, the, the fall of Judah even. Uh, this is towards the end of the monarchy. Uh, so we're going to open our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 35. Sure, this is a Bible, a book of the Bible you flip to quite often, Second Chronicles, especially the end of it, chapter 35. And we're taking a look at one of the last kings of Judah. This is the king Josiah. You may remember from your Sunday school days, Josiah takes over as king when he is only eight years old. Um, and as he grows up and as he tries to learn what it means to be king and, and try to do that right, um, they start cleaning out the temple and he finds a scroll of God's law and um, starts implementing it because they'd forgotten about it. It had been kind of tucked away in the archives there. Um, and he puts in some of these reforms and turns out, by and large, to be a very faithful and prosperous king. And yet... Here he kind of does his own thing. He doesn't listen to God's word, and it ends poorly for him. So this is 2 Chronicles chapter 35, starting at verse 20. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho king of Egypt went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. Josiah went out to meet him. But Necho sent envoys to him, saying, what have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I'm not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry. See, supposing God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him, but he disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. And the archer shot King Josiah. The king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. So his servants took him out of the chariot, carried him in his second chariot, and brought him to Jerusalem. He died and was buried in the tombs of his father. All Ju Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah. And all the singing men and singing women have spoken Josiah in their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his good deeds according to what is written in the law of the Lord, his acts first and last, behold, they are written in the book of kings of Israel and of Judah. All right, so we've already talked about Megiddo here. This is, uh, he goes to fight on the plains of Megiddo. But he's fighting against the king of Egypt, Necho. Pharaoh Necho is his name. Um, we'll pull out, kind of zoom out from this map and see a little bit what's going on in the wider Middle Eastern world at this point. So here we've got a map. Uh, this is the land of Israel right here. Just kind of a small little blip in this scale of the worlds here. Um, Necho has come from Egypt, from Memphis. He's trying to pass through the land of Israel so that he can get up to Carchemish. Because over the last few years, the Babylonians, uh, the Medes, the Persians uh, have been making their way slowly but surely a little bit closer to this land between. Uh, if you want to um, take a look at this map you can. It goes into a lot more detail, but um, it's the Chaldean king from Ur slowly makes his way conquering Babylon and Asher and Nineveh. Eventually, uh, the, the Median king, um, king of the Medes, joins him and they fight together. They take over Haran and they meet here in the battlefield of Carchemish along the Euphrates River here. The king of Egypt He's not just going to, to Israel to take over. Right now, he doesn't care about that. He's got bigger fish to fry. 
Um, right now, the people of Israel and Judah have been in decline. Uh, Assyria had come and taken over the kingdom of Israel to the north and taken them into exile. They weren't a threat. The kingdom of Judea, uh, of Judah to the south, was really not a huge threat either. Josiah was about the last solid king they have. The next king lasts for three months before he's taken into exile. There's another king that lasts for a few years, but he's a puppet king before finally uh, Babylon comes and takes him out completely. But Egypt wants to guard this trade route so that they can continue on into Turkey and Greece and Rome. They would love to have more control of um, this fertile crescent here. Uh, and Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian expansion at this point would only cause them trouble. Egypt's trying to pass through the land, and yet for some reason, uh, King Josiah doesn't want them to go through. So back in our map here, Josiah meets Pharaoh Necho on the plains of Megiddo, and he's killed. Uh, Pharaoh apparently didn't want to do this, the king Necho. Uh, that was not his goal. And yet, because of Josiah's stubbornness, because he didn't listen to the words of the Lord, that God was actually speaking through Pharaoh Necho, um, he was killed. He was put to death. There, again, is a word of warning for us in here. We need to listen to God's word. Now, it's a little more nuanced than that. How do we know when God is speaking and when he's not? And that's a whole other question for another day. But our lesson is listen to the word of the Lord. If you go against him, it will not end well for you. All right, now we're going to put a few pieces together here before we uh, move on to another uh, portion of the Jezreel Valley here. Um, so if you would open your Bibles uh, to the very end, to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, we'll go verses 12 to 16. Revelation 16, 12 to 16. Now, we've got to be very careful as we're handling the book of Revelation. It's very easy to take things out of context and to turn things into um, more sensational things than they should be. Um, and yet, we do recognize that the book of Revelation is written in a different way than the rest of the New Testament, and indeed, most of the rest of Scripture. There's a few Old Testament chunks that are written in this apocalyptic style. Uh, but the way that John is recording this revelation that he is seeing um, is, uh, we, we call it um, apocalyptic literature. It's, it's steeped in symbolism. Most of what happens in Revelation, it's not necessarily meant to be taken literally. There are symbols here, intentional symbols, that point us to deeper truths, to something else going on here. So, this is the end of one of the major sections of the book of Revelation. This is kind of, uh, John has looped back, told this story now for a third time, and this is kind of how this account ends of the end times. He writes, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake keep, keep, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. All the army assembled at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. All right, Paul, this is what you were asking about earlier towards the beginning of class as we saw this picture. 
Uh, as you write it out in Greek, it's Armageddon, but in Hebrew, it's this Har Megiddo, the plains of Megiddo. Uh, so with Megiddo right here on the border of the Jezreel Valley, this Har Megiddo, this Armageddon is the Jezreel Valley. And as we look at, just even back over what we talked about tonight, you know, battles between uh, Deborah Barak and the Canaanites, uh, battles between Gideon and the Midianites, uh, Saul's downfall on Mount Gilboa, King Josiah being killed right on the plains of Megiddo, let alone all the other battles that take place in history from before the Israelites come into the land. We've got uh, historical records from the Egyptians fighting battles in this area. Uh, we have Romans fighting in this area. We have crusade battles being fought in the Jezreel Valley. Uh, we eventually have, um, during the this, uh, British mandate, during World War II, there, there's continued battles that take place in this Jezreel Valley. This place is emblematic of death and of battles and of God fighting in this place. So even with just the four accounts from the Old Testament that we heard today, what happens when God fights on the plains of Megiddo, Armageddon, the Jezreel Valley? Historically, what happens when God fights here? He wins. Yeah, God wins. There are pretty major battles that happens here, but God wins. God reigns supreme. And this is a place where that happens and that is seen most clearly. Now in this uh, valley here, what happens when you oppose God, his word, his will? What happens when you try not to fight with him? You're defeated. They're killed. You lose. It's not good when you go up against God in the Jezreel Valley. He's going to win, and you're going to die. So here in the book of Revelation, there's the great battle of all evil and wickedness being set against God and his army in the Jezreel Valley. What do you think is going to happen? Well, God's going to win. Evil, wickedness, just death will be defeated. And that's what we see in just a few chapters in Revelation. It actually pauses and we don't get the battle till chapter 19. And even then, the battle's won. The, the one fighter that we see on God's side is someone white, riding a white horse. His, the horse is called Faithful and True. He's reigning in righteousness, judges, and making war. His eyes are like flames of fire. On his head are many crowns. He is a name that no one knows but himself. But this warrior on God's behalf comes to battle with a robe already bloodied. He has already been slain, but he's alive. Yeah, very clearly, this here is a picture of Jesus coming and defeating God's enemies here in Armageddon, the Jezreel Valley. Um, it, it's not a bloodbath as in uh, it's a strong battle and you don't know who's going to win. Jesus shows up and it's over. We don't get extended pictures of modern nation warfare in this valley. It's God shows up and God wins because that's what happens when God shows up in the Jezreel Valley. A lot happens in this chunk of territory. A lot happens in this land. But we see above all that God will keep his word and that God will reign supreme. It's, it's easy to read the book of Revelation in particular and get really confused and disheartened and just beat up over the whole thing. Uh, but there's hope here. There's hope at Armageddon because God wins. Because that's what happens at Armageddon, historically and in the future. God will reign supreme.
any other thoughts or questions about this uh, section, or at least what we've talked about so far in the Jezreel Valley? All right, if there's nothing else, then we're going to take a look at just two more accounts that take place here in the Jezreel Valley. Um, it's not as related, doesn't tie in with, you know, all these battles going on. Uh, but there is more going on here in the Jezreel Valley, as we will see. As we will see, this is kind of a bonus here. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. Again, I tried to cut down this reading so I wasn't reading 30 verses just as a whole. It's, it's hard enough to hear that when you're in person. It's even worse when you're just hearing it over the internet and trying to follow along that way, getting distracted by everything going on in your home. Um, so I tried to cut it down here. I'm going to shrink down the story into the bare bones. Uh, it, it'll be familiar for us here. One day, Elisha went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put for him there a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Uh, flip forward a, a few verses. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. He said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, Carry him up to his mother. He lifted him and brought him to his mother. The child sat on her lap till noon, then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. She called to her husband and said, send, send me one of my servants and one of the donkeys, that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And I had a few verses. Elisha came into the house. He saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. As he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. He got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up, stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. He summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. When she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. She came, fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. She picked up her son and went out. All right, uh, we're familiar with this story. It's probably been a while, as it has been for me, from my Sunday school days hearing about this, but Elisha raises this woman's son. Uh, son has died, and Elisha brings him back to life. This happens at the town of Shunem. And we heard that earlier together in our evening. Um, that was, what is it, the, uh, the, um, the Philistines with Saul's battle were encamped at Shunem. Uh, this time they've gone out, it's a Shunammite woman, her son is there. Um, it's actually just a few years after Saul, uh, this is in the divided kingdom here, uh, and there's this woman, child dies, and he's raised from the dead. Now, we want you to keep that story in your mind, that account in your mind, and flip forward to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, 11 to 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. 
As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. He came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Again, a wonderful miracle here, Jesus raising a widow's son. What connects this to our reading from 2 Kings is where it takes place. This actually has a pretty unique connection with Elisha. If Shunem is on the southwest side of this hill of Mora, Nain, it's not listed on this map, but it's just on the other side of the hill. Uh, it would have been really uh, only a, a mile or two away from Shunem, just incredibly close by. And you see with the response of the people, they are making this connection to a great prophet has arisen among us. God has visited his people. Um, there's all sorts of connection. The woman's son dying, only son, uh, dead for a considerable amount of time, uh, seeing a great prophet coming and, and healing him, raising him from the dead. Uh, Matthew and Luke both love to play this out a little bit with Jesus being greater than Elisha or Elijah, being the one to come and fulfill um, even in a greater degree what happened in the Old Testament. It's pretty incredible to see this and, and to recognize Jesus has that spirit, the spirit of Elijah that was passed to Elisha in a double way, uh, and here it's even greater. Jesus doesn't have to do a multiple part healing. He doesn't have to lay down on the boy or, or breathe or whatever. There's no sneezing involved. Jesus just says, get up. Young man, I say to you, arise. And he sits up. Here in the Jezreel Valley, God's will reigns supreme. Be it in battle or in bringing about life, God will have his way and nothing will get in the way of that. And that's uh, actually pretty incredible to think about all the history just in this chunk of territory here. All right, any other last-minute thoughts, questions, comments on anything we've talked about tonight? Not hearing anything. Pastor Lasansky, do you have anything to add about the Jezreel Valley and, and all your travels there? Looks like we just lost his connection. That's always fun. <laughs> the joys of technology, isn't it? Um, well, that's about all that I have for us this evening. Um, let's see if I can get us back to my video here. Here we go. Very good. Yeah, Jezreel Valley is, is pretty... Uh, awesome to watch all the events of scripture taking place here and we only touched on a few of them trying to make sure we got out um, in a reasonable amount of time here uh, plan is for us next week uh, we'll take a look at another city this will be the city of Dan uh, take a look maybe a little deeper look into some of the events that take place there as, as God is working in and among his people If there are no last-minute questions or comments, uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer and let you go for the evening. Let's pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.